724, where we were at last week. And then we're going to go through the first part of Romans, Romans 8. Anyway, we are heading into this amazing chapter in Romans. You know, G.K. Chesterton, he was a prolific writer about 100 years ago. And he, he said, uh, he was asked once by an um, interview person, if you were on a desert island and you could have only one book, what would that book be? And they were expecting him to say the Bible. But he mentioned uh, a certain man's techniques for shipbuilding. That's the book that he would want. And techniques for, for building a boat to get off of that, that island. Now you have in your Bible what well, seems like one book, but it's actually 66 books. And if you could have one book, one book out of those 66 books, if I could have one and I didn't have the others to, to access and I could only have one, it would be Romans. And if I could take the book of Romans and take one chapter, it would be chapter 8. So this is a special thing that we are starting to look in this particular chapter. And, and one of the most important phrases, two words, is found in verse 1. And you see it, uh, you saw it up there while, while, they, while John was singing, but it's no condemnation. No condemnation. After seven chapters of telling us why we're condemned, then Paul starts off this next chapter, no condemnation. No condemnation. That Jesus Christ is the answer. Verse 24 says, You know, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That Christ is the answer to chapter 7, which talked about the struggle. And we went through that last week. The struggle that Paul is going through in a life without the Holy Spirit. And now in chapter 8, we see what the difference it makes in a life with the Holy Spirit. I was listening to a man who's a pastor and a counselor, and he was attending a, a meeting that they have to go to for uh, getting certified for counseling sessions. And the guy that was speaking was a man that uh, has a work with men who hurt women, who, uh, who are harmful to women. And he, was, he had been doing this ministry for 25 years. And this pastor, who was part of the audience, asked him in the question time, what kind of success have you had after, you know, within a year or one year out of, of them not going back to that type of behavior? Or how many of them have gone back to that behavior is really the way he asked it. And the guy said, well, 100% of them have gone back to that within a year. And his pastor counselor said, well, have you ever told any of them about Jesus Christ? And this counselor up there who was giving the speech began to scoff at that and said, that's ridiculous. And the guy that asked him the question said, well, I think it's ridiculous to do the same thing for 25 years in a row with zero, zero success. And he continued. Yeah. Paul was struggling. Paul was, was dealing with very difficult life of trying to live a life that would honor God. And he continually failed. And he struggled and he struggled. And here you have in, in this 39 verses of chapter 8, it starts off with no condemnation. It ends with no separation. And in the middle of that is the difference that a life of faith can make. Because we're all running this race. It's a difficult race. And if we fall short of the one thing that makes the difference, then no matter how hard we've struggled through this life, we've failed. You know, why is the marathon 26.2 miles? If that ain't the craziest distance that you would ever have a race, not just that it's long, but it's odd. Well, supposedly the Greek guy who ran the original trek from Marathon to Athens to report on the uh, defeat of the Persians that they had achieved, the Greeks had, had achieved, he actually ran 25 miles. And when he got to the end of the 25 miles, he got to Athens and he said, Nike, victory. And he fell over and died. 25 miles will kill you. Well, in 1898, the marathon was introduced into the Olympic Games. 
25 miles. 25 miles long. But in 1908, the games were held in London. And the distance from Windsor Castle to White City Stadium was actually 26 miles. So they stretched it out to 26 miles. And then when they got that distance uh, arranged, they realized that the royal family was not going to be sitting at the, at the finish line. They were going to be sitting a little bit farther up. And so they added an extra point two miles. You can't have the royal family having to move down. And so after that, they ran 26.2 miles. And after that, they kind of argued for the next Olympic, what they were going to do. And they settled back in at 26.2 miles. And now that's what we're doing in our day. But you know what? If you have this long race, if people are trying to stop at 25 miles an hour, and they're not going to reach the royal family, you can, you can run and, and try as hard as you can to please God. Try to keep every aspect of the Old Testament law. But if you fall short of the royal family, if you fall short of Jesus Christ, you run in vain. And that's what Paul was doing. That's what chapter 7 describes, that he was laboring, he was struggling. He said, things I, do, I don't, I, things I want to do, I don't do. Things I don't want to do, I do. I'm, just, I'm falling short. I'm a failure. Wretched man that I am. Who's going to set me free of this body of death that's constantly failing? That can't live up to the perfections that God has placed upon us for an expectation to be saved. And then he starts this wonderful presentation of Jesus Christ. And the difference the Holy Spirit makes. Up through these seven chapters, he's mentioned the Holy Spirit, I think. Some say two, some say four. I didn't go back and count. But now in chapter 8, he's going to mention him 19 times. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes on the scene. Two things that you need to know this morning about yourself. Number one is you're as bad or worse than you think you are. Wretched. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, wretched person? God's mirror, we look that way. And Paul recognized that as he tried. You know, C.S. Lewis said you don't know how bad you are until you tried to be good. Paul was trying to be good. But he couldn't do it because he has what we all have. He has this nature that's bent. And it's bent toward falling short, sin, missing the mark. Falling short of God's standard that he has, has given to us. And because of that, we look at ourselves, as Paul did, after striving to be different and said, wretched man that I am. You know, if you just sinned one time in the morning, one time in the afternoon, and one time in the evening every day, and you started doing that when you were about 10 years old, and you died when you were 80 years of age, you would have committed 76,650 sins in your lifetime. And a lot of people would say, three sins a day, I'm a good person. Almost 80,000 counts against you standing before God. It's pretty bad. But we would think that it would be pretty good. We're as bad or worse than we think that we are. Second thing is God's grace is more wonderful and amazing than you think it is. And that's what Paul is going to say. He's going to point to it and say, even though I'm this wretched man, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. There is now because of my relationship with him and what he has achieved for me, no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ, even though I'm wretched. And the more godly Paul got, the more he saw his sin and his ugliness in God's, from God's vantage point. Wretched man that I am, no condemnation. And whenever you look at that first verse of Romans, and if you count the, the words, you come to the fifth word in the English. The way that Greek would organize their language, they would take the most important word and they'd put it at the front. They called it the emphatic position to put more emphasis on it. And the number one word in verse one is the word no. That's how it starts. No. And it's the strongest way you can say no. No condemnation. That's so what Paul wanted us to hear. No condemnation after all of that struggle and failure. 
No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Zero condemnation. Being in Christ, that's, that's what makes the difference. Paul was trying to do it by being in, in Paul, in Paul's body, and trying to achieve the, the requirements of the law. But there would be condemnation there, because we all fall short. But in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. You know, whenever you go to the airport, you go through the security, and it's, you know, it's kind of a you know, don't joke or don't make any, any sudden moves or anything like that. You know, when you're going through the airport security, but the big thing that always bothers me <laughs> is they don't let me take my water through. I may have just got this brand new water, I forgot, I, you know, I brought it with me, and there it is. And they won't let me go through there. And there's this big bucket of all these full water bottles that you pass by. Well, I'm just ornery enough, I'm going to chug that thing. <laughs> They're not letting my water through. You know, if I, I could try to sneak it through, I could try to put it in the bottom of my bag. You know, they got that, that little x-ray machine. They're going to find it. And if you go through Beijing, China, you have to go again through their security. And when you go through their security, they really examine it through that x-ray thing. They bring everybody in. They put you on a pedestal and have your hands out like this, and they just wand you all up and down everywhere because they don't trust the security you went through in San Francisco or or Dallas, or somewhere like that. But that water is not allowed there either. So I chug it. I can't hide the water, they'll find it. I can't get it through their security. But I can get it through. <laughs> if that water is in me, it goes through. If it's in the bottle, it ain't gonna make it. If we're in Christ Jesus, then we are protected because what is going through the security of heaven is Him. And we are inside of Him. We are in Christ. No condemnation. And here you have Paul saying that I am a wretched man. And the word for wretched, uh, they took their word callous from him. And that meant that he had been trying and trying and trying. And he hadn't been able to do it. He'd failed continually. I'm a failure. I'm, I'm callous. I'm wretched. And then in chapter 8, he talk, starts talking about the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, that there is liberty. John 8.32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what Paul asked. He said, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, we just went through 9-11 this past week. And there's a story from 9-11 about a guy named Wells Crowther. And he was known as the man with the red bandana because when he was a child, he received a bandana from his father and he always brought it with him everywhere that he went. He said, I'm going to change the world with this red bandana when people would make, make fun of him. Well, he worked in the South Tower of the World Trade Center on the 104th floor for a, a business called Sandler O'Neill. And the plane struck the tower, that tower, on the 78th to 84th floor. He took that red bandana, tied it around his, his face, and he made his way to, all the way down to the 78th floor where he found people at an elevator. He picked up a woman who was injured, and he told the other people to follow him down the stairwell. 18 floors down, the air began to clear. He put the woman down, he told the group to continue. He turned back, went up, and he got back to the 78th floor to another group of people that were waiting. He guided them down the stairway. And no one knows how many trips that he took up and down this, this stairwell, but his body was discovered six months later in the lobby of the South Tower. He was lying beside firefighters, and uh, the only identification, no, they identified him because his red bandana was still on him. He could have run for his life. But he kept going up and down. You know, Jesus did not have to come. He right. said he lowered himself. He emptied himself of all of his rights in heaven and he lowered himself to be like us without the sin nature so that he could live above sin and he could achieve the forgiveness that 
we could benefit from because he wouldn't have to die for his own sin. He could die for our sins, which were placed upon him on the cross. Who's going to set us free? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh in order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we have this freedom in Christ. Number one, we have freedom from judgment. We have freedom from judgment. Chapter 8 tells us that this life of victory can be ours in Christ, but we have these two laws that are at work in us. One is the law of our humanness. In chapter 7, Paul talked about that, doing the things we don't want to do and not doing what we, we want to do. He calls it in chapter 8, verse 2, a law of sin and death. It's this humanness that we have. There's a law of sin and death. We just cannot pull off what God demands of us to live a perfect life. We can't do, we, we can't keep from doing what we shouldn't, and we can't achieve what we should. We always fall short. So we have this law of humanness in us, but we also have this law of a new nature. He calls it the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And I had that in, in me. When, you know, when, when my life turned around, all of a sudden I wanted to do so many different things I had ever wanted to do before. I wanted to pray more. I wanted to read the Word of God more. I wanted to share my faith more. I had, a, I had brand new things, brand new thoughts in my head. A brand new voice in my head. Brand new thoughts in my mind and, and brand new desires in my heart. This new law was in operation when I was 20 years of age. I'd never experienced it before. I want to pray more, study more, witness more, serve more, be what God wants in every area of life. That's what that law makes me want to do. But I got this other law that's still there, that humanness, that makes me want to watch, you know, you know, watch a certain television show that's probably not good, that's wasting my time instead of studying the Word of God, or to sleep in. All these humanist laws that are kicking in and fighting against this new law. And the world tells us, well, that's the way that we should live our lives, especially this culture that we're in. You know, I was growing up in Manfred, Oklahoma. We had a big yard. We have part of our yard that made a perfect baseball field, softball field, wiffle ball field. And then we had another that made a perfect football field. But it had one problem. In one quarter, one end zone, as we drew it up, there was where our septic tank seat to the surface. <laughs> and of course, when you had a new kid there, you didn't tell him, that, okay, you take a, go over to the other right. Okay, I'll hit you over there. Nobody will cover you. Believe me, nobody's going to cover you. Of course, they would get mad. Hey. But if you really wanted to score and the game was tight, you just bit the bullet and went into the septic. And you caught the winning pass. Now, I never did that because it wasn't worth it to me. This, I knew this game wouldn't matter. It wasn't going to make the news. Uh, nobody was really going to care about it. But some kids, they wanted to score. They wanted to win. Yeah, you got ahead, but you're not coming to my house like that. And you may have got ahead in this life, but you're not getting into God's house with that stink all over you, with that sin all over you. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this? You know, the prodigal, the difference between the prodigal and the pig and the pig pen, the prodigal suddenly realized he was in a pig pen. The pig was real happy. He wasn't going anywhere. He liked it. But something came into the heart of the prodigal son that said, I don't belong here. And whenever God changes your life, that question comes in your mind. What am I doing here? Why am I doing this? This is not the new person that I am. And our new nature will struggle. It'll be uncomfortable in the midst of where we used to be comfortable. And how do we begin to walk consistently down that path? A true believer will stumble and hate where he lands, 
but he'll get up and he'll turn to God for help. And God won't remove the struggle, but he'll give you the path of victory to overcome that struggle. The old man, you know, Satan loves to use the old man. If he can access the old man in our life, who we used to be, that is still there, that humanness, he will stroke it and get it going. And if we're, not, we're neglecting that relationship with the new man, we're not in the Word of God, we're not praying, we're not seeking the power of God, we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to, to govern and guide and empower our life, that old man will step up and take over. And that old man will never be a Christian, but he can be a pretty good Baptist. He can, he can operate in a Baptist church pretty comfortably. Uh, but when something dramatic changes, all of a sudden we surrender to the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will begin to direct us away from things that the old man would have done. In verse 25, Paul's conclusion is, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. On the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. So here you have this brand new person who's seeking to walk in grace and freedom. And in my mind, God has, has put this desire to live very differently, but yet I'm enslaved to sin. But God has made provision for me. He's made me a brand new creature. He has given me a new heart and a new mind, and he's made me the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is now resident in me. I got to let him operate. I got to let him be at home. I got to let him call the shots. I don't want him in the car. I want him behind the steering wheel. I want him controlling the gas and the brake. In John 8, there was a woman who was brought to Jesus. She was a woman that was caught in adultery, and the Jewish leader said, The law says to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? And that's what our accuser says when he comes to Jesus. You know, look what they've done. The law says do this to them. What do you say, Jesus? The law says that we should die. But what does Jesus say? She was caught in adultery, which was, um, which was a big thing then, but it's just a sin. She could have been brought, they could have brought up a woman caught in gossip. It's still a sin. Jesus told us, began to stoop down, which he did for us. He stooped down. He came down. And he began to identify the sins of those around him, probably, riding in the dirt. And they began to disappear from the oldest to the youngest. And then he said, does anybody condemn you now? She says, no, they're gone. She says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. A lot of people like to, to pull that out and say, you know, let him with, out without sin throw the first stone and and don't judge me and all that kind of stuff. They forget the last part. Go and sin no more. That's what Jesus told her. She surrendered her life to him and to him as lordship. Called him Lord. And go and sin no more. You know, in the Jewish Mishnah, adulterers, the punishment for them, other than stoning or while they were being stoned, they were placed knee deep in a box of manure. And after being placed in the box, they were stoned until they slumped over in the slime. And after the execution, a tree was planted in the box of manure to stand in the city as a testimony of the seriousness of sin. So if you lived in a shady place, that's not good. That shows a lot of problems in that town. Uh, maybe that's where it came from. I don't know. Again, Jesus, fast forwarding to the end of that story, neither Go and sin no more, neither do I condemn you. No condemnation for those who have had an encounter with Jesus Christ. No condemnation. And Paul does not say no mistakes or no failures. He doesn't say no more problems, no more sickness, no more death. Sin has its consequences even when it doesn't have its condemnation power anymore. Satan always wants to point to our past failures and guilt and things. To try to bring us down. But if God's not going to condemn us, I don't care what Satan says. I don't care what his opinion is. The highest court in the land acquits us. Why do I care about court circuit or county court or something like that? The Supreme Court says I'm good. I'm good. And the highest court has said that we are good. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now you have this brand new law at work. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
In John 5:24, it says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. We are secure in Christ. He says, those who have believed my word, here's my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life, has that protection. In Genesis chapter 7, it talks about the ark and the construction of the ark. And it says that the ark had within and without pitch. It was covered with pitch, what it called it. The Hebrew word that is used there for pitch is used elsewhere in the Old Testament for atonement. For atonement. So the ark was covered with pitch uh, so that it could be the way of escape from the divine wrath of the flood. God told Noah to get in the ark and he shut the door and he was surrounded all around him and on the inside and outside with atonement. With that pitch protecting him from that storm of judgment. Those who were outside the ark were outside the pitch, outside the atonement. And so they were subject to the judgment that came. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is a law in effect that protects us and, and uh, from the judgment, the condemnation that is to come. This is this new law that's at work that produces life and not death in spite of this human law, human law of humanness that we are caught up in. So the power of this new law, two things. Power number one, to save us. Verse three says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. The law couldn't save you. It doesn't mean the law was bad. Because in chapter seven, he says the law was good. But the law was unable to save you, not because it was bad, but because of our flesh, our inability to keep it. The law was weak because of us. It was weak to save because we weren't savable through the law. But God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in sinful flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh. He became an offering for sin and he condemned sin in the flesh, in his flesh. Sin was condemned. Because he paid the debt for it because he didn't owe that debt. But he took our debt. And he paid the debt of that. So what the old law could not do, God did through Christ. Could not save us because it was weak through the flesh. You know the word for weak, we get our word anesthesia from that. We were weak. We were knocked out. I can remember twice I think that I've had anesthesia for for operations. And they, I remember them telling me, you know, count from 10, count down from 10. I got to nine. I mean, it was tough. That stuff was strong. It knocked me out. That anesthesia just put me in total weakness. And that's what this humanness does. It puts us in a state of weakness. We can't keep the righteous moral code of God. We fall so fall short, fall short of the moral nature of God that we have no ability to achieve our own righteousness. And that's what the Jews were trying to do. They were trying to achieve their own righteousness. And that was the message of Romans, is you can't do that. You have to come to the point of saying, wretched person I am, who's going to save me? And then there's Jesus Christ, whom God sent to provide that salvation for us. So it has the power to save us. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, without the problem of the human uh, sin nature, without any weakness that we have, and he lived obediently for God. You know, all the Old Testament sacrifices, I was reading this morning in, in Hebrews, and it says they were a reminder of sin year by year. Because the blood of the goats and bulls were unable to take away Sin, it says in Hebrews 10. They were all pointing toward the day. You know, they were like a stay of execution until the day the uh, 
the guilt could be taken away. When Christ would come and be the, the satisfaction as far as a sacrifice. So power to save us and power to keep us, verse 4. In order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's our choice right there. Are we going to walk in the old man or the new man? We got, we got used to the old guy. We've been living there until we got saved. Our nature's changed. Our mind is different, but our habits are there. That's second nature to us, but we've got a brand new nature. The requirements of the law are fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That means what the law asks of it, we can start to begin to actually start to live it. We can actually start to live above that sin pattern we used to constantly exist in. We can have a whole brand new experience at life. Matthew 5, uh, 17, it says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but... To fulfill it, Christ met the requirements of the law, like it says here. And when he did that, we were in Christ, as Romans 6 says, and it was fulfilled in us, in his death, burial, and resurrection. And now, we, have, we can walk, not according to the flesh, but we can walk according to the Spirit. You got all that in there? That's the gospel. That's why these chapters, 6, 7, and 8, are so powerful. It adds it all up. Paul structures it out. And the proof that we are truly born again is that we are not walking according to the flesh. But we are walking according to the spirit because that's where our heart and mind now is. And that's the outer evidence of an inner reality that the law of the spirit of life is at work. Now I've talked about the Wright brothers and aerody aerodynamics and all that kind of stuff. The law of aerodynamics with that lift you know, they discovered over about 100 years ago. But they did that in this little rickety thing in, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. What if you brought them forward about 50 years or so and stood them next to a 747? And they, you told them, you know, they were gone by then, but told them, yeah, that same law that you did with that little rickety thing on that beach, it operates with this thing as well. It's just crazy. That thing's huge. How are you going to get that thing off the ground? You look at your life. You look at all the sins that you have committed. It's, it's a mound beyond belief. How can you find forgiveness for that and, and the uplift to live a totally different life? You have to understand a new law. The law that Paul talks about here. This law of the spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus. We're so used to not living according to that law, not seeing people living according to that law. We just assume it's not there. and We operate status quo around us. There are people around the world who are operating very much in this law. That's 747. If you, you turn on the power of those engines and you get it moving, all of a sudden, that thing will lift itself up to 35,000 feet in the air, travel at 600 miles per hour. That law of gravity that's been holding it down, you don't go to an air, airport and you don't see them tying ropes around planes to keep them from floating up. The law of gravity will do it. It'll keep them down. The law of, law of sin and death will keep us down. It'll keep us operating just like the world. But you get that movement going. That cooperation. And all of a sudden, when you get to a certain point, that law of aerodynamics will take over and it'll start lifting that thing. And there's a power that God is waiting to operate in our life, but we have to get the engines of faith moving. Start obeying, believing the promises, and moving forward. And as we move forward with God, all of a sudden we hear this lift. But we don't move forward. We don't operate in faith. And we wonder, where's the law? Just like somebody sitting in a plane on a tarmac going, where's the law? I don't see any lift. You better turn on the engines. Get the faith going. Start moving down the runway. Step out and believe God and see what he does. 
When you see a plane in the sky, you know a law is at work. When you see a person living a life of joy and patience and, and love and service and faithfulness, obedience, self-control, kindness, faithful in being a witness, giving and praying, studying the Word of God, you know a law is at work. It's operating. Their faith got them moving. And all of a sudden their life is taken to newer and newer and higher and higher levels. If you're going to sit there and wait for God to, to lift you, when you're not operating by faith and getting, moving down the runway, you're going to spend a lifetime like that. You're going to say, I tried it, I sat in church. You know, you sat in church. You did good. You, you kept the seat warm. That's not going to get you where you need to go for God. On the cross, Jesus gathered up all the terrible, foul, evil, awful injustices, crimes, misery throughout history from every person. He gathered it all up and brought it into its condemnation through himself, through his death. And the good news is it doesn't end there because it's more than just that. It's more than just the forgiveness. It is a life, an indescribable life. I've come to give you life and that more abundant, he told them. The same God who raised him from the dead is the one who wants to raise your life from the humanness that you've been living in. You have to believe what God says is true about you. You have to see yourself as God sees you. You have to begin to know his truth and seek to live it out. And you have to start to use every part of you that you used to sin before now live to know and serve God. You've got to live in a new man. Let the old man just shrivel up and die from lack of attention. You know, let me close by sharing with you during World War II, a guy named General, General, General Jonathan Wainwright was captured by the Japanese. He was held in prison in Manchurian concentration camp, and they, they treated him horribly, especially because he was a, a general. He described his life as broken, crushed, hopeless, and a starving man. Finally, the Japanese surrendered, and the war officially ended. And when Wainwright heard the news, he returned to his, head, to his quarters, and he was confronted there by some Japanese guards who wanted to mistreat him again. And he stopped them and, and let them know of the news and he declared his authority and said, no, I am in command here now. These are my orders. And from that moment on, he was in control. You need to have a moment with Satan, come to Jesus moment. You're no longer in control. Humanists, you're no longer in control. There's a brand new law in operation. I'm gonna cooperate with that law so that I can start to soar. And I'm going to start to soar in so many ways that I want to learn to soar like the blue angels. To live an amazing life of faith. That's what Romans 8 is offering. It can be an amazing transformation of anything you've ever experienced. And the news of who we are in Christ, it has us this freedom stamped all over it that we've never known. And the same ground that, that we used to walk in as a prisoner of the same places now we're going to live through life and exert our freedom and live totally different because the rules have changed. The laws have shifted. There's a new authority in our life. God is now in control and you can claim that victory in Jesus' name. You need to learn to stand on, on resurrection ground and reckon that old creation dead, powerless. And live in the new creation, which Satan has no power over whatsoever. He's a defeated foe. The old man no longer has the power unless you give it to him by not exerting the new power. It's a daily choice that we have to make. It's a moment-by-moment -moment choice that we have to make. Because we'll be challenged every moment of every day. We're going to continue through Romans 8. I encourage you to be here for these next few Sundays, but your life could be totally turned around and changed if you learn to believe, trust, apply.
put faith in what God has said to be true. Would you bow with me? Father, we love you and thank you this morning. We thank you for uh, just the amazing life that you offer us in Christ Jesus. I thank you that he demonstrated what a man was supposed to be when he came upon this earth. And, and now he, you know, he promised that we could do even greater things as we'd be able to go into even farther parts of the earth, but we'd also have the Holy Spirit resident within us. And Father, as the body of Christ, I pray that we would have the unity to stand together in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we'd operate in the gifts and we'd operate in the, uh, the love that is supposed to characterize us. And Father, that we would uh, honor you and allow the Holy Spirit to use us as a vessel to transform this community and this country and this world. Father, if there's any here today that need to uh, come to the altar, need a decision uh, to make in their life, I pray, Father, that uh, any obstacle, any distraction that would be removed in this moment. And, Father, that this would be a day of dramatic change for their life. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We have a baptism. Josh is going to be available up at the front while uh, you're led in a, in a song. I'm going to go change, and I'll be back for a baptism. But if you have a decision this morning, we invite you to respond. Josh will be there.